Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. I'm Kristen Patzer. I'm the manager of the Women's Business Center at Cornerstone Alliance. And for those of you not familiar with us, I'm going to give you a brief overview of uh, what the Women's Business Center does and who we are. So women's business centers are funded by the Small Business Administration. We are one of those re resource partners, their resource partners, excuse me. And we offer counseling services to primarily women, people of color, and those that are economically disadvantaged to assist them with resources in starting and growing their businesses. So this week we are celebrate, celebrating National Women's Small Business Week. Yay! <laughs> with our very special program today, Woman Led. Um, and shortly I will be introducing our special guest, Paula Mendeville. And Women Led is a series that focuses on the experience of the female entrepreneur and empowerment. Uh, when we talk to our clients and other female business owners, one of the things that they always stress that is most important to them is building relationships with other female entrepreneurs. Because as we know, it's not always easy and having a support system is critical. So. We're thrilled to be celebrating women in business this week. Um, so at the Women's Business Center here at Cornerstone Alliance, there are only two of us on staff. Our director, Brandon Campbell, he is a counselor and an entrepreneur himself. And then me, Kristen Patzer, I'm the manager of the Women's Business Center. And my background is primarily in nonprofit administration. So as I mentioned, we are funded in part by the Small Business Administration, uh, focusing our program on women and people of color start and grow their businesses. So since the COVID-19 pandemic, we have been extremely busy, as you can imagine, is small businesses being one of the hardest hit during this time since COVID. Um, just since March of 2020, we've served over 7,000 small businesses. We've counseled 687 entrepreneurs. We've assisted 224 businesses start since we, um, our program began here in Benton Harbor in 2004. We've also awarded 9.8 million in capital investments and over 100 microloans totaling $936,000. So some of the businesses we've helped you may recognize in our area, Forte Coffee, Lazy Ballerina Winery, Watermark Brewing Company. These are just a few. So if you out there on Facebook or Zoom listening to us right now, um, are interested in starting a business or you are a current business owner that would like to grow, we encourage you to please reach out to us. As I mentioned this week, we're celebrating a National Women's Business Week. So um, in addition to Women Led, on Thursday evening at 4.30, we are hosting an in-person networking event, Women Excel. This is in St. Joseph at 221 Main. And we will be having um, appetizers and giveaways. And we also recently held a pitch competition. So we will be hosting the contestants and the winners, you can meet them in person. Just because it's entitled Women Excel, men are welcome, please. So we're excited to be having an in-person event. Um, this is our second one we've had. And it's so great to reconnect with everyone again after being closed in for so long. So please, if you haven't yet, sign up to join us at cornerstonewbc.com. 
quickly, I will um, review um, a bit more about our organization and how we're funded. Um, Cornerstone Alliance is an, an investor supported organization. And the Women's Business Center, as I mentioned, is funded in part by the SBA, but not entirely. So our program and Cornerstone is reliant upon investors to help support us, to allow us to offer these amazing programs for free and free one-on-one -on -one business counseling. So if you um, yourself or know of other business owners that may be interested in partnering with us on that, please contact us. You can do so um, by talking to Chris Frank. She's our Vice President of External Affairs, and you can contact me or Brandon to connect with her. And see, uh, finally, before I introduce Paula, um, is our contact information for Brandon and I. You can also find us, it's easy to find us on cornerstonewbc.com to connect with us and receive our services. So <laughs> without further ado, I would like to introduce you to our special guest today. One moment, Paula. Mendeville. She is the Vice President of Catering for her family business, El Granero Mexican Grill, which was established in 2007. Paula was born and raised in Mexico City and then later moved to Grand Rapids. But again, she's going to tell us her story in her own words here shortly. She received her bachelor's degree in business from Ferris in Grand Rapids. She's also served on the City of Grand Rapids Planning Commission and the Board of GROW, which is the Women's Business Center in Grand Rapids. It's a wonderful organization. She is a non-traditional first-generation college graduate and is very heavily involved, which she'll tell you more about too, in the Grand Rapids community and growing their entrepreneurial support system. On top of that, she was named the top women owned business by the Grand Rapids Business Journal and one of the top 50 Latinas in Michigan by the Hispanic Latino Commission of Michigan. And she was the first Latina to be on the cover of West Michigan Woman Magazine. So without further ado, and she also has a family, a husband and two sons. So you're just a little bit busy, aren't you? <laughs> well, <laughs> so welcome. Thank you so much. Buenas tardes. Hola. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm excited to have this conversation. Uh, welcome everyone who's joining, who's watching online, Facebook. Um, you know, it, it's it's so interesting and encouraging to see those stats that you mentioned at the beginning, the many, many business owners and entrepreneurs that the Women Resource Center helped through the pandemic like last year. That's impressive. And we're so proud of it, part of the entrepreneur entrepreneurship community and business ownership is not easy it's a working process but it's also very fulfilling it's a journey so thank you so much for you know thinking of me to you know kind of like not only that this week we're celebrating woman business week but also we're closing hispanic heritage month which started in september and so it's just like you know i'm someone who's very proud of her heritage and i encourage um conversations in our native language which in my case is in spanish so welcome all thank you for having me here oh you're welcome so why don't you tell us so i i just gave a quick you know overview background but why don't you tell us about you yes so again my name is paola mandeville i was born in mexico city huge city and you know I really enjoy my childhood growing up close to my family my parents my sisters 
um, in, in all relatives were there in the Mexico City area. So my grandparents, my aunts, my cousins. So I, rem I have, you know, great memories of growing up, spending holidays together, spending vacation together. Just on a Sunday, we'll come to my grandma's house. She will cook meals for us and all the cousins will just play and climb on trees, right? You know, 20 years ago, we didn't have our phones or our iPads right there. <laughs> so we we're actually very blessed to be able to just play on the streets and and have games so that was my childhood very very humble beginnings that I'm proud of again as I mentioned uh, my my heritage my language my family and I also lived in other parts of Mexico I lived in Toluca which is about an hour north of Mexico City and I did my elementary school there then I moved again to the California, which is, you know, the border with San Diego, California, you know, closer now to the US uh, because of my dad's job. He was the one who was like tra traveling all around there. Yeah. And I, I did my middle school there and I started doing high school. However, uh, in the middle of my, my well, I think sophomore year, I decided to drop out of high school. I, I didn't finish my education in Mexico. I was overwhelmed with the subject. I was really, really bad at algebra. I hated it. And instead of looking for some support <laughs> or tutors, I just like, okay, the, the school's not for me. And I started working jobs in, in the area, uh, at a restaurant, at a grocery store, you know, just different jobs that didn't really have a future for me. But at the same time, it gave me that lesson of like, if you don't appreciate what you have at the moment, um, you have to make a, a decision. And so in the year 2005, that's when my mother moved to Grand Rapids here with my younger sister, Gabby and I. So a new country, no language, but also no opportunities, no beginnings. So I, I attended Union High School here in Red Rapids. And at that time, I still wasn't sure what the city was coming from very big places and very popular cities uh, to come to a city where I walked to the park, Lincoln Park right here on Bridge Street in the West Side, and it was empty. Like I, I didn't see anybody there. So that was just very shocking to me and my sister. And so at the time being a teenager, I still thought, I, I, saw, I still thought that um, I was going to go back to Mexico. You know, I, as soon as I get, you know, old enough, I'll just save some money and go back to Mexico. If my mother wants to stay here, that's fine. You know, I, I was looking for that freedom, searching my independence. But, um, so I went to school and, and, and earned a scholarship to Grand Rapids Community College. So hopefully, you know, thankfully at that time, I was smart enough to say, okay, I, I missed my chance in Mexico because I dropped out of high school, but now I have a new and a second chance here in Grand Rapids since now I can even go to college, which I never thought before possible. And so I did, I enrolled at GRCC with that scholarship and started my journey for business administration. And a few months later, and my mom was working at an already established restaurant here that used to be called Tacos El Ganadero on Bristol here in the west side of Grand Rapids. And she started working there um, in the middle of 2006 and at the beginning of 2007, you know, we started seeing a recession here in the country. Right. So uh, we started noticing, you know, the trend of people going, moving back out of the state, going back to their countries. And um, the owner decided to go out of business. He was going to close the restaurant. My mom uh, was there and so she heard the news and she has, you know, at that time she had 15 years of experience working at a restaurant from Mexico. And um, she approached me and said, you know, I've always wanted a restaurant. I think this would be a good opportunity for us to take over. And I remember not even asking why or how, <laughs> is it even possible? We just went for it. We met at a, another restaurant nearby with the previous owner and talk and discuss details. And we just went for it. <laughs> the only, uh, a few requests 
from the previous owners was that we needed to change the name. We needed to change the menu. He was keeping like his friends. And so that's how from El Ganadero to El Granjero Mexican Grill um, was established in 2007. So that's when we started the business. I also work, as I mentioned before, in my uh, younger years in Mexico restaurants, you know, cleaning the tables until you get old enough to take orders and all of that. But my mom really, really had that experience because as a, um, she started very, very um, level, entry level at a restaurant washing dishes, but she moved up the levels, right? Within the kitchen, within the prep. I remember going to even uh, catering events at the restaurants or at the venues in Mexico, in Tijuana. I was only like 16 when I got to do a few catering gigs in Mexico with my sister, with my mom. So we have the knowledge and the experience, but naturally the insights of what it is to run a business. So I remember my husband designing the logo, um, yeah, creating our own menu. So one of the first things that my mom did when we took over El Granjero was to update the menu to, to look more like the Mexico City region, like our dishes, our ingredients. And one of the first things she put was cactus, nopales on yeah. the menu, right from the start, like we're eating nopales. <laughs> and, you know, those first few years, I remember, you know, very, a lot of uncertainty, of course, I was still going to college, trying to get as much information as I could so that we could apply it to the business. Um, I remember in 2009, mm -hmm. uh, people asked me about, oh, does your business have a Facebook account? You know, it was popular, it was the star of Facebook for businesses. And I said, no, because I don't even have a personal Facebook. And they're right. like, well, this is where the businesses are going. You know, your advertising uh, opportunities, your exposure will be through Facebook. And I remember I didn't want to open a Facebook account. And so I did, I opened my personal one so that I could manage the, the business account for the restaurant. and. You know, it, it was where the social media was uh, dictating what the, how a business can be successful through that. So we did. And yeah, so um, my, my sister was also involved a little bit. My younger sister, Gabby, she's seven years younger than me. So when I was in college, she was still in high school. And she, again, started working there mm -hmm. to buzzing tables or things like that but she didn't like it she's like mom I'm done I'm not doing this good luck to you <laughs> so she she wasn't very involved in the business at the beginning because she had no interest and you know after graduating high school she started GRCC as well and she's got you know different kind of jobs in the city but she never really wanted to you know be uh, submerged in the business like my mom and I that's all we do so you know, as I reflect, because this past October, we turned 14 years old. El Granjero has been around this long. After a pandemic. <laughs> Yay! We survived. You're celebrating that, too. We're celebrating that. And, and just a reflection, like, I cannot believe the afternoons that we spent at the restaurant, ambition, and, like, with the changes that we wanted to make, the kind of customers that we were looking for, what we wanted to leave behind as a legacy, a family restaurant where a lot of customers have stories about us. Like we started dating there and then we got married. Now we bring our kids there. You know, it's just like a whole generation basically uh, has been part of this neighborhood restaurant, which that's what we're more, most proud of. Mm -hmm. But we do remember, we remember the lonely nights with no customers, especially in winter, just looking out the window, snow falling and just like, what are we going to do? Right. But, you know, inspiration, innovation gets to you and, and you just move forward. And I think the reason why I enjoy being working at the restaurant is because there's always a chance for you to improve and to make progress. We've never liked to stay where we're at. Like, okay, we're, we're comfortable. There's always like, okay, new menu, a new brand. We changed our, our, our logo in 2010, or no, I'm sorry, 2016. And uh, the anniversary of our 10th year anniversary, we changed the logo uh, to make a new brand out of it. And 
reflecting on what it used to be not having customers, what it used to be $65,000 a year in sales <laughs> to now um, almost a million dollars in sales the past year. Oh, congratulations. So we've seen some improvements there, yes. <laughs> when you look back, so from what you're saying, you just jumped in. You didn't really overanalyze it. You just said, okay, your mom wanted to do it. And now when you look back on that, do you think? Mm -hmm. Yes. That was a also, bold move. <laughs> the look of it. We don't even own the building. We've leased it all this time, but we wanted to make sure that the restaurant was like modern. So we did a 65,000 renovation in 2016 uh, for the dining room. And, you know, it's just like to please our customers. There you have it. It looks better now <laughs> because we know the value of our product. We, we have a good product. We have good food, um, but we pay attention to the reviews back then. And we started looking, yes, they're probably gonna call us a hole in the wall kind yeah. of restaurant because of the looks of this. So let's change that. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just like, we wanted you know, to make that a uh, next step and bring it up, you know, a fresh look. And that's, uh, as I mentioned before the time we did the, the new logo in building. And so it's been a journey. Yeah, so. Okay. Speaking of, you touched a little bit, we'll, we'll move on to COVID. So not only COVID, but you happen to be in one of the hardest hit. Right. Industry. Our industry, correct. So tell us a, that story. What, what were you thinking when COVID first hit and what did you do? And, you know, as far as to pivot your business. Mm -hmm. We had we had a ton of conversations about this last year, right? And it's, right. it's hard to believe that we cannot refer to 18 months ago. That's how long our lives have changed. In the last 18 months, everybody, you know, pivoted. So for the restaurant specifically, we of course got the shutdown from Governor Whitmer um, for the dining room. So the dining room is closed. And, you know, a lot of catering, of course, also, which is right now 25 to 30 percent of our sales, you know, stopped, you know, so I was there for my customers. Yes, yes. We'll reschedule. We're canceled. We're postponing. Mm -hmm. Just working with them because they had a lot of things to deal with as well, you know, moving venues or moving dates. So catering passed, which was appropriate. And then for the dining room, of course, we had to send everybody home right so we had 22 24 employees uh march last year to suddenly everybody going home and, and having my mom and the main our kitchen manager my husband and our main cooks there to okay let's see what's what's going on if we're gonna have to shut down completely but fortunately enough we were able to do takeout so that's what we focus on and of course, takeout for the restaurant, um, we had the system, we've always offered takeout. So it, it wasn't something that we had to come up with, like a new menu and packaging. It, it was something that we did anyways, but it was fully takeout now. And so I remember at the time I was taking a program that is called Ferris Emprende to Ferris State University, University um, in which it's the same curriculum for a spring year participants so it's entrepreneurship how to start your business whether it's product or service whether it's you know a chain or very local whatever it was just I was taking the classes for myself right because what I want to do in the future is help and coach other restaurant owners other business owners on what I've learned right through all this 14 years of experience with my restaurant so I saw the need that people needed you know some guidance some some advice some structure and I told my mom I think I can do that for them and so I wanted to open my consulting firm and I went to Spring ER uh, through Ferris State University in Prende to learn more like I know I've been a business but yeah. owner but I want to become a new kind of service you know I don't have a product I have a, I have a service to offer so I really wanted to learn and structure my menu of services my even uh pricing because when you love something and you you can do it without getting paid 
guess what? That's not gonna help you pay your bills. <laughs> right. <laughs> so if you wanted to do, if you wanted to make it a sustainable business, then um, yeah, I couldn't do the favors anymore, right? To my fellow restaurant owners here in the Latino community. So I wanted to get that, that and gain insight and, and do that strategy of my pricing and all of that. And that's when everything happened. I had attended a couple classes only in person and then everything paused and then they pivoted and went virtual, which was great for the rest of the participants. Mm -hmm. But for me, it meant that I couldn't be virtual either. Honestly, we, my mom, you know, we will make only once a week for the virtual training. And my mom will call me like, I'm by myself here at the restaurant, again, because she sent everybody home and I'm busy and I'm stressed and I'm like, okay, so I will go. And of course, I could still do the program and watch the recording later, but I just felt that I wasn't having the experience. So I made the top decision of uh, withdrawing from the program at that time, just to focus on the restaurant and what we were going to do, because actually we started doing some delivery, which never we've never done before. And so if yeah. we wanted to reach more customers, then that's one of the things that we did uh, include uh, delivery services for at least for the west side here our neighbors and and so uh, that's kind of like how the restaurant um, changed a little bit and then because we saw increased demand we were able to call start calling back the, the employees okay we have this amount of hours we have this new schedule so whoever wanted and could accommodate started coming back so my mom could have more support because only you know the few months the first few months like sales drop half you know from 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 the restaurant the diner room only like i said catering pass completely but now you're looking at you know, operating on a 35 to 50% uh, sales. So, so that was you, tough. I'm sorry? Were you worried all the time? It wasn't that we were worried all the time. We just couldn't believe how long it was going to take and how, yeah. uh, how other businesses were doing, you know, better or worse. It was just, um, a matter of, of of making those adjustments and before the pandemic there was a group called well I don't even remember the name we never formalized it but we had a goal and that was, we, we were making a campaign a sustainable campaign for our businesses specifically for restaurants in which we wanted to eliminate the use of uh, single plastic bags we wanted to reduce that and eliminate in the future for our businesses. Because uh, most of the restaurants that do catering could go through a case of 1,000 to 3,000 bags, you know, every week. So looking at that num of those numbers, it was very, very worrying to see how much waste we, you know, produce here locally. So we come up with this group that wanted to reduce the single use plastic bags in our establishments. And what we were doing is work closely with the Sustainable Business Forum to get some partnerships, to get some sponsorships so that we could afford those reusable bags, the, the closed ones, mm -hmm. right? So right. we'll have our customers bring their bag and we'll package their meal. There are, I mean, boxes, but instead of using plastic bags, there, just like groceries, right? Like right. when you use those reusable um, bags. And that's what we wanted to do. Unfortunately, with the pandemic, that was not an option. Right. Uh, you know, they stopped even at those grocery stores um, completely. The, the use of those reusable bags just because of caution of, you know, contamination. So that campaign passed. And so at the restaurant, you know, it, it was just trying to figure out how can we obviously want to make our business survive, but now being 100% takeout for months, all the ways that we were producing was overwhelming. And yeah, yeah so I think uh, it was a good collaboration. Um, I believe it, it, this, this next year could be a, a good time for us to review that and reorganize, hopefully launch it. Uh, but that's yeah. what happened here in Grand Rapids. And um, what was your experience with um, the 
government co uh, COVID funding? Did you receive any PPP or idle or restaurant fund help? So we're very thankful to belong to a community where, you know, of course it took paperwork, but also we received uh, a ton of help, thankfully. Um, some of the first organizations that uh, came and show up to, to the restaurant for the assistance was the Grand Rapids Chamber of Commerce, of course, the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce with the right place, uh, Star Garden also did some money. So all those local organizations that are in the entrepreneurship um, scene here in Grand Rapids helped. We were hesitant, to be honest with you, we were hesitant about the federal grants and programs. We didn't apply to the PPP the first time. We didn't. And um, then in, in, we were able to open our dining room. And we did it very strategically, again, with our fellow so from the campaign, uh, the Green Campaign uh, folks also wanted to be part of this uh, reopening conversation now, how we could, you know, do it smart and do it safe for our customers, for our families, for our employees. And we didn't open right away, even when we could. Uh, I think it was, you know, reduced to 50% capacity at the time, um, limiting six people at the table, mm, you know, um, but we, we continue to do most takeout. So when we finally opened the dining room, with conversations on you know training again your employees on on all those safe steps to avoid contamination and all of that um it was for a few months only before we got shut down again no. so the dining room was like oh, up and down up and up um but again we continue to do takeout i remember also those months um it was safe they they lifted some restrictions on catering and gatherings. So we got a few events, you know, for 25, 30 people. And um, most customers were comfortable coming to the restaurant and picking up the food in trays and they'll take it to their events, their homes, oh, okay. so that we didn't have to serve that many people, you know, be exposed to so many guests, um, you know. So some we accommodate some of those things. Um, but then we were able to open the dining room again fully since uh, February this year. And we haven't, you know, even though there were rumors at the beginning yeah. <laughs> of the first uh, quarter of the year that we might go back to Shannon at the dining room, that didn't happen. So we continue to have the dining room open, take out. Now, I know so many businesses couldn't afford or couldn't, um, they didn't have the capacity of opening at 100% capacity right so mm -hmm. you you were able to you know put all your tables again and have all your staff back but it's been a slow process for us honestly um we don't have all the tables that we used to have our dining room is open for 56 people and right now you know when all the tables are occupied we're looking at 40 people so we still we still are not a hundred capacity, but we just don't want to overwhelm our staff. And we really like to have those tables separate and space. You know, it's not it's not the six feet anymore either. From twenty five or you know fifty percent capacity, we went to seventy five. But still, it's it's nice that we're not a hundred percent yet. In our case, I know so many restaurants were able to and more than free to do so. But right now, um, going to your question on the PPP, um, the second round in March, we did apply for that one. And again, with the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and their training program, they put us in contact with the Northern Initiative, which I'm familiar with. And I've also recorded videos for them in Spanish to provide their clients and customers um, with that some of that education pieces on business ownership. And um, yeah. Israel from Northern Initiatives was phenomenal. He advocated for small businesses so that we can get, you know, most of the grants that second round, especially yeah. if you didn't apply the first time. And um, that was a blessing, you know, in disguise that we were able to obtain those funds. Wonderful. So um, how are things now? I, 
I know that you, I'm sure like everyone else are um, suffering from the shortage of employees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so how has that? Yeah, we couldn't believe, you know, we thought, okay, everybody yeah. uh, will want to go to work or <laughs> that's not the case. Um, yes, all industries, retail, restaurants and breweries we we can see all everywhere you go you'll see the signs hiring and hiring and hiring um so we're very thankful for our team we cannot thank them enough for choosing to be there for choosing to show up to work because i've heard stories where people just don't call anymore you don't call in sick you just don't show up and that's the way things are going for some reason which is unreal um you have to understand here in, in our economy, a lot of our immigrant workers and undocumented workers don't have that option, don't have that choice. They cannot just decide not to go to work and don't show up one, one of these days. It just doesn't go like, it's not in our moral, it's not in our culture. We we want to you know provide for our families. I My parents raised me to believe that any job as long as you do it with dignity, any job is fair, right? You you support your families with that. And and so I think that's what most of the Latino and um, Hispanic small businesses are doing. They do have their employees, but we have the extra demand because now, you know, if people get assistance or unemployment, they do have those spending funds, right? They can do entertainment, they can do dining out they can do all those things so we're overwhelmed we have this you know uh responsibility with our customers to do a good service at the pro a good product but we have to live on our shelf staff we're shelf staff we there there has been days that restaurants close now a day a week which impacts your sales you know through the week through the month through the year if you're closing one day and it's not because business is slow it's because you don't have the staff and you don't want to overwhelm your current staff and if they need a day off then they have to close down their the business so it's it's really you know unreal that we're looking that we're living through these times where if we want to balance this is your balance choose <laughs> your business self or your health and family time and your you know sanity it's it's come to this point so i don't know of uh, any business that is full staff and they have you know all the hours they want everybody's looking right now so one of the things one of the conversations that we've had is a small business a small business is how can we you know compete against those uh, chain restaurants or corporations that are, are advertising sign-in bonuses, which is great. I mean, if you're in need of staff and you want to welcome them with a few hundred bucks so that they work for you or with you, why not? But luckily, realistically, we are investing in our current employees instead. Mm -hmm. And I know it's, we need the help from outside, like more employees, new employees. But looking at our payroll, where the same 10 people have been with us for the last 18 months, I want to give them the $500 bonus or the $1,000 bonus to them, right. not to newcomers. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, if you're a new employee, you'll get there. But <laughs> right. Um, I think, you know, we have to, we're going to invest in them. And so for the first time ever, I'm so sorry and embarrassed that it took this long, but we're not offering benefits to our entry-level employees. And, and um, you know, whether it's the uh, washing dishes or prep cooking or the service or the line cook, they get benefits. And right now we have that flexibility that they do work long hours because we don't have anybody else, but they do have flexibility because they can arrange um, scheduling. Uh, and right now, you know, it's if they're not there, 
uh, it's either my mom or I that have to, you know, cover for them. But if that's gonna take, if that's what's going to take to keep them motivated and going, then that's okay. And sometimes we'll prefer if there's communication and planning ahead, sometimes it's an emergency and they suddenly couldn't show up, that's fine. We can accommodate. But at the end of the day, you're not gonna um, have both things. Now we do have, it's not a balance anymore. It's like choosing, okay, I, I want my health today. So you give your back to your business and it's like no sales. Mm -hmm. Or you know what, you motivated your team, they're ready to go, it's work 12 hours a day have yourself but you're going to be exhausted at the end of the day so right now the balance is gone it's choosing what which one do you want today pretty much we've seen that through a lot of small businesses i know it's you seem though you remain positive you seem very positive mm -hmm. in that you yeah um, you said you like to help and encourage other entrepreneurs and and women so that leads is you know as we mentioned this month is national women's small business month hispanic heritage and so what what advice do you have for women out there that that are considering starting a business but they're just held back they're held back by fear or failure or how do you approach it mm -hmm. I think um, one of the, yes, I, I'm a very positive person. I like to always find the best side of things and don't look at the negative. And, um, you know, we can ignore it, but at least, you know, moving ahead, moving forward. One of the things that help our business is the collaboration and the uh, closeness we have with so many restaurant owners specifically but just in general other business owners um there i'm a part of a couple of different chats and at least you can vent out because <laughs> nobody else is going to understand you the way they do because they're in the same exact position that you are the frustration the anger but then also the hope and the you know oh encouragement so at least we're part of those groups and if not therapy, then <laughs> <laughs> yes, at least the camaraderie, like, okay, yes. So we've done some Zoom calls and Zoom socials, we call them. Everybody at home with their own drink, like just bend out. That's fantastic. And uh, uh, yeah, so out of COVID, I can say that we, we got to have that, you know, um, being honest, being real with our partners. You know, in the outside as business owners, oh, she's successful and look at her restaurant, all of that. But they don't know the day to day. They don't know the tears and sweat that goes to a business. It, it could be glamorous. Like today, I'm having this conversation with you, did my makeup and everything. But guess what? Sunday night, I'm going to be mopping my bathroom floors because <laughs> someone's not going to show up to work. And, you know, it's, right. it's that that extreme, I will say extreme of how, um, but when you love what you're doing with, you have the passion that my mom has, the passion for cooking um, and, and her dishes and our, again, being part of our heritage and, and culture in cuisine, then it's gonna be worth it. So some of the collaborations we created was thankfully through the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce after we went we uh, went through the program Transformando West Michigan, which is an initiative to train and educate business owners. And it doesn't matter if you're new business owners or you're 14, 20 years in business, you always have something to learn and to adapt and to apply whatever topic you're looking at, especially during these difficult times where we never know what to expect. What's the next thing going and throwing at us, right? From our business perspective. So um, that ability for me to reach out to them and say, I'm here for you and, um, you know, uh, guide them, advise them, that, that's great. So people do that for me too. So my first advice for the future entrepreneurs or current and new business owners is like, have your team have that village and that network of support uh, we are good at what we do which is mexican food it doesn't mean that we're good at accounting or 
you know, advertising or insurance, we have, that's not our expertise. So we, we, we network so that we can collaborate and um, partner with those experts on their heels. We need insurance, we need an attorney, you need your CPA. So all of those aspects of the business, you don't have to do it all. So don't feel overwhelmed. And for that reason, the second advice is you're going to have to invest. Don't see it as an expense. Of course, in your documents and your income statement is going to feel like an expense. You're paying for all of these services, but it's worth it. And it's going to give you the freedom to know that your business is in good hands and while you do what you're good at, your product, your service. So that will be two main things that collaborate, reach out. And also, I guess, like I said, those conversations have helped. But if but if you truly think that you're overwhelmed, you're stressed, you're depressed, you're frustrated, then look for help and professional help. We have so many, you know, health, mental health professionals here in the area, workshops and, and you know, 800 numbers that you can call. You need to look for help. We don't want, you know, it's been outrageous 18 months of adjusting and seeing things that we never thought or expect uh, with our families, with our businesses. So um, again, thanks to the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, they provided some mental health workshops, not only for you personally, but for the rest of for the businesses and their employees. So that's crucial. If you don't have the sanity yourself, how can you project that to your business, to your employees? And how can you do that at home? You can't. Right. So look for that help and it's there and there's nothing to be embarrassed or ashamed of. I've looked for it through meditation, through retreats, through better nutrition, uh, exercise, whatever it is that is gonna keep you sane, do it, do it for you. And the rest is going to, uh, you know, reflect. It's gonna be reflected on how you run your business, how you run your family. Oh, that's excellent advice. And I know I was reading um, everything that you do, and I thought, how can she balance all of that without going? So you're involved in organizations. Then I read you also, you're, you run a soccer team, don't you? <laughs> I used to be co captain of a yeah. okay. West Side team. I'm not good at soccer, but that was my mental health, right? Oh, I wanted to play, right. I wanted to be outdoors. I wanted to be around people. I'm not really good at it, but I just went for it. And um, not this season. They play, they did pick up games and not the official league that we have. Very intense, very competitive. But you know, just to see some familiar faces on the field playing. And then afterwards, of course, we will go to a local business to support with dinner or drinks and just like get to know each other better. And, and that's a league that's been in existence for six years. So yeah, uh, I don't claim myself like the best soccer player, but I love it. And you know, why not? <laughs> yeah, why not? <laughs> exactly. And like you said, building relationships and connecting with, you know, chambers, WBCs, entrepreneurial support organizations, or like the networking at all. Yes. It all helps. So I'm going to see if we have any questions. Those of you on Zoom, if you'd like to unmute yourself and turn off your camera, you're welcome. Those of you on Facebook, um, you can comment with questions there as well and we'll answer them live here. So please don't be shy because <laughs> we'd like to hear from you and know your experiences as well so yeah there are so many many resources um locally and you know many of them are membership based so there is a, a cost but i i don't know if i mentioned this but um having the restaurant going to school I also work at the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. So I have six years in background running the chamber and you know the events, the membership meetings. And one of my directors at the time, Jorge Gonzalez, um, now he's at Star Garden, he used to say, you know what? Our membership is like a gym membership. 
if you have it and you pay for it, that's not gonna give you results. Look, look, look this, look at this belly, he says. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just I just have my YMCA membership and it's not gonna do nothing. You have to get involved, come to our workshops, come to our meetings, connect with members, reach out, there's a directory, whatever needs you have, reach out to members first, utilize it so that you see the results. So I always joke and it's so true that yes, having a membership to anything, not necessarily a chamber of commerce, but anything is not gonna give you the results, you need to work for it. Mm -hmm. So whether it's local first that have membership or you know there's chambers of commerce, or any business association if they have to invest in yourself and pay them and then go to their events go to their meetings whether it's virtual or in person they start investing and they start making those relationships and start um, getting you know that exposure with businesses i think that's one of the main things that help our business because my mom was pretty busy you know cooking and making menus and doing catering and all of that and I've always had a presence in the community going to meetings going to events and and that positions your business in, in a way that people don't necessarily need your service right away but they met you and they will remember you for a referral in the future so that's the way I look at it for every you know 100 people that you meet you're at least gonna get some business and you don't know where it's going to come from but you have right. to you know just distributing those business cards i remember this summer we catered a wedding and it was a small wedding outdoors so we did that and one of the customers one of the guests of the weddings has a company here locally and she needed catering for her um, employee appreciation day so she loved the food and she called me she saw the car and she called me and so you know you always need that uh, exposure. Yeah. Okay, we do have a question. This is a question I had too. This is a good one. <laughs> I'm interested in knowing about the culture shock experienced when coming here from Mexico and the business culture shock. What were some issues from a personal and professional level and how did you adjust to overcome the barriers and challenges? It was a cultural shock because in Mexico, I had some entrepreneurship experience too. Like yeah. It could take another full workshop and another full hour to learn about. But, you know, in our Latin American country, sometimes it could be as easy as opening your garage, putting tables out, and you're cooking in your kitchen, and that's your restaurant. I'm not joking. That's how businesses are run in Mexico, right? right? Here, you cannot never do that. Mm -hmm. And so going to the licensing and permits and um, few, uh, the, the health department for your food license, and that's a lot of work. And you better be prepared, especially in the restaurant industry. Now, through the years, we've had some innovation like ghost kitchens or industrial kitchens, where if you have a product that is, you know, um, that you're cooking, baking, things like that, there's different kinds of licensing. So it's, it doesn't have to be a restaurant always. It could be something that you cook at an industrial kitchen where they have those permits and you pay for them to make your product there and then you take it out you sell it someplace else you sell you sell it online so you, you don't have like a, a storefront so that's one of, of of those many learning lessons that we oh my god our food permit is this due for renewal i'm like taking classes for uh food safety and it's just like yes you better be prepared <laughs> But thankfully, I actually, I took my class at GRCC at the time. It was in 2010. I remember that I took that course. And then um, I was able to meet with my health department and inspector. So, you know, again, they're not the most friendly people <laughs> because they do have a very important job to do. But they also provide resources for you, especially in the, in the, in the restaurant industry. So that was one cultural shock. Um, my personal check again, I'm from big cities, you know, I, uh, at nine years old, I used to ride the bus to school by myself. Like and the city bus, I, not the school bus, right? <laughs> right, the city bus, correct, the city, the city bus. bus. Uh, pay for it and, and, you know, mm, then go home. And also, 
in Mexico, we have morning shift and afternoon shift because we're so popular. Schools cannot only host, you know, one group. No, it's always the morning and the afternoon. So I, I used to go to the afternoon shift. So my hours were from 2 p.m. That's where I start school until like 7 or 8 p.m. every day. Oh. And so, yeah, you would, uh, would you could take a, uh, the city bus at 8 p.m. at night but you got home and, you know, it's, it's one of those things that here, you know, I don't see that happening. You will never see a nine-year-old on a city bus at 10 p.m. <laughs> going, you know, from the library to home. That's never going to happen. So things like that, that made me more intimidating instead of being like, I was the one who was from a big city where crime happens all the time to suddenly hear, oh my gosh, everybody's so quiet and reserved and friendly. I left my bike out of the parking lot once, nobody stole it, like what's gone? <laughs> so those were like the ones that, okay, okay, you're safe here, it's a safe space. Yeah. All right, do we have any other questions? So it, it was a long question. I think as there was something about the adjustments. It took practice. Like I said at the beginning, I yeah, really wanted to go back. I didn't want to stay here in Grand Rapids. I thought that for sure when I was 18, at least 18, I could just go back to Mexico. So it took, uh, for me, that sense of belonging, saying you're not going back anymore or right now, then at least embrace it, be part of it. Because in school, a union. I was one of the very few Latinas that I dyed my hair in purple. I used to have a tongue piercing. I dressed all in black. So people were scared of me. And if people wanted to go to a dance, you know, baile at the Delta Plex, I don't listen to the music to bring with regional like Duranguense and Banda, things like that. That's not my type of music. I wanted to be at uh, Van and Delorina for the System of a Down concert. That's where I wanted to be. And there were no friends that wanted to do that with me. So it was a huge adjustment for sure. But it was mostly because of my personality and uh, likes. Nah, because people were not friendly enough. They they were, you know, inviting me to, you know, Delta Plex. I'm like, no, thank you. <laughs> so you felt you were accepted when you came to yes. Grand Rapids yes. specifically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see. I don't think we have any other questions. Well, thank you so much. This no, thank you, Kristen and Brendan for inviting me. Oh, well, you're welcome. Absolutely. And um, if anyone out there would like to get in touch, with Paula, you can reach out to us at the Women's Business Center. Yes. Cornerstone. And another reminder also, and you just said how important this is for our networking event on Thursday. Thursday yes. in very person at 221 Main and St. Joe. Come and meet uh, the other entrepreneurs and build your support system Paul was talking about. Yes. It really makes a big difference. So again, you have any questions, concerns, reach out to me and we're happy to help. So thank you again. All right. Until have next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Adios.